<laughs> accidental this morning. Not happy about it at all. Um, hi, 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 Gail. Hello, hi. Um, good afternoon. Happy uh, Tuesday. On today's stated agenda, the council will vote on five Article 11 property tax exemptions approved by the council's finance committee. The first are uh, the Putnam portfolio in council member Ayala and Perkins's district. Uh, and it's going to preserve a little more than a thousand units of affordable housing. There's St. Anne's apartments in council members Ayala, Vanessa Gibson, and Rafael Salamanca's district. Uh, all these are in the Bronx, and it's 87 units of affordable housing. And the last is 603 Pontiac Place in council member Ayala's district. And it will make a technical amendment to an exemption that granted that was granted in 2016 to construct 25 affordable units. The council will vote on the following land use items. The first is in council member. Karen Kozlowitz's district, and the second one is in Councilmember Costa Constantinides' district. Both applications will bring non-conforming buildings into conformance with zoning. 784 Cortland Avenue in Land Use Committee Chair Salamanca's district will facilitate the development of a 20-unit, 100% affordable building. And the council will vote on the following pieces of legislation today. First is pre-considered intro number 1631, which would ceremonially co-name 86 streets, thoroughfares, and public places for people, including several police officers who died in the line of duty and some first responders who died of 9-11 illnesses. Next is 1272A, sponsored by Council Member Barry Grudenchik, and it will amend reporting requirements for organizations that are affiliated with elected officials but do not engage in promotional activities such as advertising for those elected officials based on feedback to a local law passed last session and with the support of the conflicts of interest board this bill sets separate reporting requirements for these they're called unrestricted organizations without changing the requirements for restricted organizations the bill will still require unrestricted organizations to report to the conflict of interest board but to do so without placing an undue burden on them and in a manner that will allow COIB to focus its oversight on the types of concerning activities that both COIB and the law we passed intended for them to do so, to focus on. Councilmember Grunetchik isn't here today. Uh, next is introduction 886A, sponsored by Councilmember Rafael Espinal, and it will create a pilot program for pet harbors that will allow owners to leave pets unattended in safe, enclosed shelters on sidewalks adjacent to commercial establishments for a short period of time and Councilor Espinal isn't here. Um, from uh, the Transportation Committee, we have introduction 1457A, sponsored by Councilmember Carl Smanchaka. A lead pedestrian interval intersections have uh, made walking in the city much, much safer, and I'm excited that the safety benefits of LPIs will now be expanded to include cyclists. This bill will allow cyclists to follow the pedestrian control signals at LPI intersections. Uh, allowing them to safely enter the intersection before lights turn green. Uh, this bill has the potential to literally save lives. We have lost so many cyclists in our city, and recently we've lost a bunch of cyclists, and we must do everything we can to prevent more cyclist fatalities and deaths. This is a common sense, easy solution, and I invite Councilman Menchaca to come forward and speak on this bill. Thank you. Uh, when I started this, everyone, I want to read a few tweets from New Yorkers who have submitted testimony through Twitter from Rachel Cole. She says, I fear for my husband and my eight-year-old son's life every time they bike. By biking instead of driving, they reduce emissions and congestion for everyone else. The more people that bike, the better. The least we can do for cyclists is to protect them from getting hit. Another. Uh, New Yorker stall tactics says, I use city bike regularly and stop at every red light. LPI for bikes NYC hashtag will enable me to get out of the front of the car so I can signal my intentions when I move through the streets. This is a win-win for everyone on the road. And then finally, uh, Street Films, who you might be following as well, says, we have two LPI for bikes NYC in my neighborhood in 34th Street in Queens. And when traveling with my son on my back of of uh, back NYC, they're extremely valuable to get a safe head start, the LPIs. There are other LPIs also, and we, we sometimes use them, though they're unofficial. Well, now, 
after today, we're going to make them official. And I want to say thank you to the speaker. Uh, this bill would never have moved unless he uh, understood the, 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 the progress that this will make on our streets. And the progress has already been made because New Yorkers are already using these lights. In so many ways, this piece of legislation is catching up to culture of safety on our streets. And I can't wait to continue to do more of this work. Um, as the speaker has laid out an ambitious uh, agenda for safer streets, and I want to say thank you to him and the rest of the Transportation Committee. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, next, we have two bills related to parking. Introduction 84A uh, by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch will help to clarify whether certain parking restrictions are in effect by requiring the Department of Education and the Department of Transportation to post information online about when public schools are in session over the summer. And Councilmember Deutsch isn't here. Uh, and next is Introduction 570A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger. And it will create a defense for parking violations in cases where both sides of the parking sign are illegible. And I invite Councilmember Traeger to speak on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleagues and our great borough president who's here as well. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, of course, to Speaker Johnson, uh, his staff, and uh, my council colleagues for supporting uh, intro 570 in relation to ele illegible uh, parking signs. This legislation will resolve a frustration for residents that receive a parking ticket when there's illegible signage. When parking si when a sign is illegible, People don't have notice that a restriction is in effect, but can still receive a, a ticket. It is within the finance department's discretion to dismiss these tickets, but they're not required to do so. And many people don't know that they might be able to get their ticket dismissed for illegible signs, and the standards for dismissal can be unclear. There should be more pressure on DOT to maintain parking signs citywide, and the onus should not be on taxpayers and residents for the basic responsibilities of government. This issue speaks to a larger problem within DOT. It just takes too long to get things done, whether it's a study, whether it's to install signs or, or, or lights, but just to even fix a sign to make it legible for people. This is basic government, folks. And so I, I really do appreciate the speaker and the staff for supporting this, this bill. I think it's common sense uh, legislation. And again, I thank my colleagues for their support. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we're going to be voting on a package of bills designed to help small businesses by providing needed support and information and by allowing us to study them more closely. The city uh, severely lacks the data necessary to make informed policy decisions relating to the small businesses that are so vital to our neighborhoods and communities, and these bills will tackle this issue head on. Introduction 1049, sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, will require an assessment of storefront businesses and the business environment of at least 20 community districts every three years, including a survey to business owners. The assessments would be done in coordination with community-based organizations. And I invite Councilman Rivera to speak on this bill. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for letting me speak on, on this bill. I have another uh, resolution on marijuana testing and uh, pregnant New Yorkers. But this first intro 1049, we call it the State of the Storefronts Bill. We urgently and I think desperately need this data to be able to assess what is happening throughout our cities. This requires the Department of Small Business Services to complete an assessment of the state of storefront business in at least 20 community districts once every three years. The challenges facing small businesses in New York City are well known. In my district, it is just as common to see a big box store as it is to see a vacant storefront and a small business. So what we are trying to do is really assess the data and make sure that we are pounding the pavement and looking at our communities because our neighborhoods are very, very nuanced and we need to be able to assess what is happening and the challenges that we are facing in order to, to, to preserve mom and pop. So I want to thank the United for Small Business New York City Coalition for their input during our negotiations with the administration over this bill. And I believe the passage of the State of the Storefronts will mark an important step in helping our city small businesses survive an increasingly complicated retail landscape. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my staff and Jeremy Unger and a number of the people here at the council. Um, I know that the speaker takes our, our, the survival of our storefronts very, very seriously, and I'm looking forward to working to pass more legislation to support these operators. Thank you.
And from Councilmember Mark Jonai's introduction of 1467, the chair of our Small Business Committee, uh, would require the Department of Small Business Services to create an online user-friendly compilation of rules and regulations that apply to small business owners, which would be updated as agency rules are amended. And also, introduction 1000B would establish a city definition for micro-businesses as those with fewer than 10 employees and requ would require specific reporting by small business services on these mom and pop shops and I invite Councilmember Jonah to come forward and speak on his bills. Thank you uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, I'm grateful to you for your support and leadership. Small businesses are in trouble whether it be big box store competition, consumer behavior changes, government regulation or the internet that has undermined business practices. This is government being proactive, not reactive. When we often think of small businesses, we think of the local pizzeria, the local diner. The definition of a micro business is specific to mom and pop shops. What many of us make, know make up our commercial corridors, our communities, what they are, the stability that they offer, the job that they offer, but more importantly, the tax base and employer that they are. Business with less than 10 employees are responsible for almost 80% of New York's workforce. We have to ensure that they have an environment which they continue to thrive and prosper. So I congratulate all of my members uh, in the council, including the council staff, the speaker, as well as the Small Business Committee on taking this very proactive approach to having a better understanding of the issues so we can better address them and be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Thank you again. Introduction uh, 1471B, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, would provide additional support to the small business community by requiring small business services to provide training and education related to efficiency and regulatory compliance and marketing. Uh, and also from Councilmember Rosenthal's introduction 1472, and it would require reporting on commercial properties and would establish a public data set of information related to leases, vacancies, and property specifications collecting this information and making it accessible now is key to sound policy making in the future and key to us being able to uh, legislate here at the council so I invite Councilman Rosenthal to come forward and speak on these two bills. Speaker may I uh, allow the, the borough president no, no, to go first? No, oh, I'm she, fine. Yes, go right you can go. All right. Uh, it was on the behest of uh, Manhattan Borough President Brewer. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal. I'm pleased to sponsor two bills critical to identifying solutions to the ongoing loss of our small businesses across the city. Small businesses are a meaningful economic engine for New York City with over 50,000 retail and restaurant businesses employing over 600,000 people across the five boroughs. So whether it's our five Chinatowns or the hundreds of Caribbean-owned businesses in Flatbush or the South American restaurants and businesses of Elmhurst, successful small businesses are the backbone of the middle class, particularly for new immigrants. They are an economic multiplier, recirculating their revenue within our local economy, creating even more growth. They're a crucial vehicle for entrepreneurship, especially among recent uh, arrivals to our city. And these businesses provide critical neighborhood services and most importantly, culturally relevant retail for so many New Yorkers, whether in Bed-Stuy, Flushing, or on the Upper West Side. We also know that keeping a small business open is increasingly challenging. My storefront tracker legislation will require citywide tracking of commercial storefront and second floor spaces for the first time. It will provide critical comprehensive data on both current vacancies and commercial strips at risk. Most importantly, it will identify vacant locations by address. We will have aggregate numbers by census track of storefronts whose leases are coming due in the next two years. 
Protecting this economic ladder is critical to fostering economic opportunities and equitable opportunities across New York City to solve the commercial vacancy crisis. However, it requires solid data. I'd like to thank Manhattan Borough President Brewer and her staff for their partnership in developing this legislation. And I'm also proud to sponsor 1471, requiring the city to provide technical assistance to small businesses, especially building an e-commerce presence. Um, both of the bills are part of a comprehensive package to help protect small businesses and begin to address uh, the empty storefronts impacting so many of our neighborhoods. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Joni, as well as Rob Newman, Rachel Cordero, Irene Byshevsky from the Speaker's Office, and my legislative director, uh, Ned Terrace. In fact, this is the last bill that he will be responsible for helping me pass. I will miss him. I'd also like to recognize the tireless efforts of advocates and organizations fighting for our local small businesses, especially all of those within the United for Small Business New York City Coalition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. And Helen said it, but uh, I am very, very excited that Manhattan Borough President Gil Brewer is here with us today. She has been just an incredible leader and champion on these issues for years and years and years. When she was in the city council, she was uh, really one of the leading voices on doing innovative things to protect small businesses, pushing the envelope. She did it in her time as local council member and pushing for uh, zoning regulations to protect small businesses on the Upper West Side. And she worked with us on this entire package. So I want to uh, thank her and ask her to come up and speak on these bills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker Johnson. And I certainly want to say that this is an important issue. But as we all know from data, whether it's the open data bill that I passed years ago, if you don't have the data, you can't fix the problem because you don't know how to measure it. And that's why I think this is really an exciting uh, aspect of the small business crisis. Uh, we all know that there are, is an ap epidemic of empty storefronts, and we know the impact on the neighborhoods. Everyone listening and in this room knows. We know that if you have unoccupied stores, you have less foot traffic on the block, you have fewer eyes on the street if something goes wrong, and of course, less convenience and uh, streetscape for the neighborhood residents. So it's whether it's the Lower East Side complaining about this issue, the West Village, Hell's Kitchen, Chinatown, Washington Heights, Upper and uh, East and Upper West Sides, everyone has been talking about this issue. We, we know the problem, it's there, we see it with our own eyes. We know that city law currently, currently does not include any tool for measuring and tracking these storefronts. We've walked up and down Broadway, I know that the council member Rosenthal staff has walked up and down, but we don't have anything that is real data in all five boroughs. And I think that's exactly what intro 1472 does. It's the first in the nation. That's very exciting, Mr. Speaker. Yes. First in the nation. Thank you, all of your colleagues. Public database of ground and second floor retail spaces and their vacancy status. The hell with San Francisco. They're usually first. They're not this time. It's very exciting. Never beat them before. Ah. Yes. So uh, this database will be a boost for business owners looking for pop places to rent those facing lease negotiations. It will inform city-initiated policies, most importantly. Zoning language will be informed. Services will be informed. And all other kinds of services. That's why I'm really appreciative of the city council, of the speaker, of the council member, Helen Rosenthal, and certainly Chair uh, Joan I. This is exciting. And I do say that um, we have a lot of work still to do on this issue, but data is important. So I want to thank, as I indicated, the speaker, Council Member Rosenthal, the chair of the committee, and all the staff members. I, too, want to talk about Rob Newman and Rachel Cudero and Irene Bajczewski and certainly Ned Terrace and from our office, the amazing Jim Karras. <clears throat> Jim Karras, that's a personal issue. We'll know how great he is because he's going to be here at the city council, mm -hmm. some of you know. Um, Jessica Mates, Daniel Alam, and Shuler Warren Puder, who did an awful lot of work on these issues. Um, and I want to thank all the groups, particularly ANHD, but all the groups who have been working on this. And I, I can say that let's, let's, I know that it's going to go into effect in 90 days, and there will be rules and regulations. I want to also add that the 
Owners of buildings have not been complaining because this is information that they already collect. So this is not onerous on either the owner or any of the commercials. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to call up uh, Rafael Espinal to speak on his bill on pet harbors. Thank you, oh. Mr. Speaker. Hello, Madam Board President. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, small businesses are struggling to survive in New York City. Those that are owned and operated by women or people of color often face even more challenges than typical bureaucratic red tape. It is our city's job to partner with diverse innovators and entrepreneurs and help them realize their goals. In 2017, DogSpot, a woman-owned and Brooklyn manufactured business, began to pick momentum throughout the borough. Residents were delighted with the solution the company had found to, to a uniquely New York problem. What do you do with your dog or your pet if you want to go into a store that does not allow them? Dog spots took up little space, but provided a secure and air-conditioned way to leave your dog outside while you shop. But without warning, the DOT issued a cease and desist for the use of sidewalk space, despite having the permission of the business owners. My bill intro 886 sets up a pilot program for companies like Dog Spot to operate in Brooklyn. Just like everywhere else in the city, our storefronts are in a crisis. This bill would not only this bill not only supports a small business, but also gives an opportunity to other small businesses to increase their customer base with pet owners. If our city was a true partner to small businesses, this bill would not be necessary. We shouldn't be needing legislation to legalize each entrepreneurial venture. However, I hope today's vote sends a message to innovators, and especially those marginalized in their fields, that we are committed to making this city a welcoming place for their new ideas. Thank you. Uh, finally, the council will vote on three important resolutions. Resolution uh, 746, put forward by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, calls on the New York State Legislature to pass legislation requiring the creation of fair regulations for hospitals related to drug testing people who are pregnant or giving birth. And I want to invite her to come up and speak on this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this bill, Resolution 746, calls on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation requiring the New York State Department of Health to create clear and fair regulations for hospitals on drug testing, those who are pregnant or giving birth, including informing patients of their rights before any discussion of drug use or drug testing. We know from studies that women who are black and brown are more likely to be tested for drugs than their counterparts. And we have seen from reporting by the amazing Yasmin Khan at WNYC that these tests in New York City hospitals are leading to children being separated from their families. At our hearing in April, New York City Health and Hospitals admitted there were issues with their drug testing policies and said they would explore written consent for drug testing expectant mothers. But this is not an issue found only in our public hospital. It is not an issue that can be solved one public hospital system at a time. I call on the State Department of Health to immediately implement rules and end this policy of needlessly tearing families apart. And my work on this issue is not going to end with this resolution. I plan on chairing a hospitals committee hearing in September on cultural competency in the delivery of healthcare services. And I hope that the representatives of our hospital system have a better answer on how they will end what is clearly institutionalized ra racism in our medical care and have a better answer than they did in April. Thank you. And resolution 740 by Councilmember Brad Lander calls on the New York City Administration for Children's Services to implement a policy that mere possession or use of marijuana does not by itself create an eminent risk of harm to a child or warrant a child's removal. And I invite Brad to come speak on this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This really builds on what uh, Councilmember Rivera was talking about. Um, uh, several years back, there was some very strong reporting that showed that we have situations in New York City where families have been separated, where children have been taken for nothing more than marijuana possession or use. Um, we had the same hearing in April at the General Welfare Committee um, where the commissioner made clear that's not their intention. They don't have a policy to do it. I think there's less of it than they're used to. But we've heard from lawyers that it still does happen on occasion. At a time when we know so much of how disproportionate enforcement is here, so African-American and Latino families are far, far more likely uh, to face charges. Um, you know, there are, uh, I'll be honest, I, you know, I have friends and, and colleagues of mine who, um, if marijuana use or possession was a reason
reason to have your kid taken away from you, boy, family separation would be a whole lot more than it is. We should not be doing it. We all know we shouldn't be doing it. ACS needs to establish a policy to make a bright line, bright line rule that mere possession or use is not grounds to remove a child from a family. It's that simple. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to really praise your leadership and, and Councilmember Powers in reaching out to the Board of Corrections to make sure that close attention was paid. Um, and they've just issued a report that comes in part from that letter that you and, and Chair Powers wrote. And I was proud to be a, a part of their delegation. Um, but I just want to give credit to your leadership on calling attention to something that really needed the light of day and that we can and must do better as a city on. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Brad. And uh, lastly, and, and of course, um, shocking and deeply upsetting, but I am so glad that Councilmember uh, Miller and Councilmember Chin, who is co-sponsoring this resolution with uh, the Chair of Us Civil Service and Labor Committee, Resolution 897A, calls on Congress to finally pass, someone leaned against that, for Congress to finally pass and the President to sign legislation permanently authorizing the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. It is shameful that it is necessary for us to do this, but Congress must act immediately to support those who were so brave to take action at Ground Zero in the days and weeks and months afterwards down in the pile, particularly when we have lost so many lives. Uh, I want to thank Javon Patel from uh, Spectrum for chasing down uh, Senator Paul, who you know, in a cowardly way, wouldn't answer his questions about why he is blocking the Senate from permanently reauthorizing this. And so I want to invite uh, Councilmember Miller to come up and speak on this very, very important resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon. So I, I, our movement to preserve the dignity of 9-11 responders, workers, survivors, recently lost another, uh, more champions, and retired NYPD Detective Louis, Louis Alvarez, and last week, Kevin Nolan, Richard Driscoll became number 199 and 200 from the New York City <laughs> Fire Department to die from 9-11 related issues. And they were joined by retired Sergeant Thomas Finnessy and Detective Christopher Cranson. To honor their sacrifice, the council was voting today to adopt Resolution 897, calling on Congress to pass the Never Forget Our Heroes, Zadroga, Pfeiffer, and Alvarez Permanent Authorization of September 9-11's Victim Compensation Fund Act to make the fund permanent and solvent, which along with my colleagues, uh, which I, along with my colleague, Council Member Chen, has sponsored, together with our fellow advocates and the bill sponsors, Congress Member Carolyn Maloney, Senator Thurston Gillibrand, we are calling for a national attention plight to this plight of nearly 50,000 responders and survivors across the country that have been diagnosed with 9-11 related conditions. The number of uh, newly diagnosed conditions dramatically increased this year and will soon surpass those who will actually die on September 11th. Over $5 billion have been awarded to those sick and injured seeking through, uh, help through the Victims' Compensation Fund to address their needs, but the new claims have been reduced by 70 percent. And if something is not done, the next claims will be reduced by 50 percent. I'm, I'm sorry, to up to as much as 30 percent will they be receiving. This legislation is desperately needed to ensure that those who were promised that they would be taken care of and properly compensated have the peace of mind that they so rightly deserve. We expect that the Senate will vote this out, further, furthering the, the, the House bill that was overwhelmingly passed with 402 bipartisan votes. For its part, the Committee on Civil Service and Labor will continue to do its work on behalf of the 9-11 community as well as exposing the ground zero toxins that have yet and those who are suffering who have yet to join this universe. As you know, we've done uh, uh, this past session a, a hearing um, trying to capture in the emerging uh, universe within that community those who return to work uh, in, in uh, the 9-11 area 
and, and, and may be suffering now. I want to thank the, the, the uh, speaker for his leadership on this and allowing us the latitude, not just the latitude, to do the work that we're doing in the Civil Service and, and Labor Committee, but ensuring every week and every day that the victims of 9-11 of and their families are given the dignity and respect that they deserve. I want to thank Councilman Chin for her, her leadership, and I look forward to the passage of the Never Forget. Our heroes act. Thank you. Um, did you want to say anything? No? Okay. Uh, that is it for today's agenda. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. And first, we'll take any on topic questions, any of the issues that we just discussed. Anything on topic? Ivan? When it comes to the bike, though, I know there's been some concern about it being the public about how this works. Councilman um, Todd, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, those concerns have been part of the discussions. This has been a bill that has been in. Uh, formation for the last four years. This actually came out last session. Education needs to be a part of it, and the Department of Transportation and the NYPD are both dedicated to figuring out how we concentrate education around the intersections where most LPIs, uh, the, the use is high. Um, that'll be after the bill gets passed, and so we're, we're working with our neighbors uh, in our neighborhoods to figure out how we get information out, multiple languages. This is something that has been part of the conversation. Street signage was used during the pilot project that gave us data that showed that the use of LPIs was actually a very safe use of um, space for bicycles. Uh, but this is something, if you're, if you're a bicyclist, you, uh, you're already probably doing this. And so um, I think the best way to describe this is signage is not gonna be necessary. This is part of the low cost uh, uh, option that we have here and allowing for the pedestrian intervals to be the signage for the bicyclists. It's already happening uh, in culture right now. So no signage. Only, I uh, will say this, this is a asterisk and this is part of the NYPD negotiations. There will be signage where uh, LPIs are not going to be uh, allowed. And that's, so that's on the, on the opposite side. This is going to unleash the opportunity for people to use what's already safe for people in our, in our uh, in intersections, which have proven to be some of the most dangerous parts of our streets, our intersections. Councilman, a follow-up. Yes. There's been some talk that it narrows in the mixture of cyclists and pedestrians to put the pedestrians in harm. Do you address that particular uh, Well, and so that's just feedback, right? So that those are those are visions of, their, of people's thoughts. Uh, the data. Uh, I think the borough president said it best. Data shows us what's real and what's not real. What's real is that this data for the last year has shown us that that does not happen. Uh, this is NYPD conducted with N DOT. Uh, this is why we're now we have support from the mayor uh, and the administration. That just does not simply happen uh, at intersections. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, was, um, I was remiss, and uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that today, this very day, is the uh, anniversary of the uh, tragic loss and assassination of Councilmember James Davis, which happened uh, literally 16 years ago today, uh, and uh, Gail was there. His senseless death is a stark reminder that gun violence can occur anywhere, and um, we think about Councilmember Davis when we walk into the Members Lounge where there is a plaque in his honor that talks about his life of service as a police officer, as a member of the City Council, as a community leader. Um, and uh, I want his family to know that we continue to think about them. And uh, he is in our thoughts today, they are in our thoughts today, and I, I wanted to mention that. Any other on-topic questions? Okay, off-topic. Joe? I think, uh, and I want, the, I want uh, the borough president to speak on this because the reason why this commission was set up was because of a bill that former public advocate Tish James and uh, current borough president Gail Brewer uh, put forward, and that's what created this commission. Um, and so I want to allow her to speak. But I would say, you know, I think the 89 Charter Vision Commission got uh, 
most of it right. They did a very good job. Fritz Schwartz, who was the chair of that commission, and Eric Lane, who was the executive director. You know, 30 years later, we look back, and um, I think so much of it was done in a pretty thoughtful, appropriate way on figuring out the balance and equilibrium that needed to exist inside of municipal government when the Board of Estimate was ruled unconstitutional and the City Council got budgetary and uh, land use authority, which previously it didn't have. So um, on this commission, you know, I, um, I didn't want to um, interfere, have a heavy hand with this commission. I wanted them to really take a broad look at the city charter. They did that. They had many, many, many hearings. They went out, they listened to experts in certain issue areas, and they I came back with, I think, some really good areas they're gonna focus on, which is you know, strengthening the CCRB, uh, looking at, um, you know, just a whole bunch of areas, the budget process. I mean, there's a lot of stuff they looked at, and so, uh, I haven't had a full chance to, I haven't had a chance to read their full report yet, but I'm impressed with the job that they've done. Um, you know, it, it looks like there may be advise, further advising consent of the Corporation Council. That gives the City Council more authority. So th there are things in there that strengthen the City Council. Um, but, you know, in a process like this, not everyone gets what they want. And the Commission, I think, has handled this in a very professional, thoughtful manner. And I'm proud of the work they've done. I'm proud of their service. And we'll see what the final, final questions look like after this final meeting. But I want Gail to be able to speak on this as well. Thank you very much. I, I mean, I was around for the 1989 commission, and that particular commission really did change the way in which city operates in a positive way. Um, I think this issue may be a little bit different than your question. I'm not so sure that the council balance isn't correct with the mayor, so I, that's not so much what I was concerned about. I do think that um, when we see the final results, obviously CCRB is a good thing, more advice and consent. I would have liked to see more challenge on the land use when we see the final uh, version. I think that's something that you should look at. And also on the budget. I would like, without changing where the powers exist, to see more transparency. Transparency on budget, transparency on land use. And those are two topics. Um, I think the mayor's people, and I get along with the mayor, could have been more supportive of some of the ideas that came through the process. Uh, well, you don't have to take it away. You could just do no, more planning. It's not take. It's not. It's just more making sure the public has more information rather than shifting power to the city council. And when you shift power to the public, then the city council too has more information. So that's where I would have seen some changes. But the process was excellent. The speaker's correct. There were hearings. There were stakeholders. There was outreach. Um, very different than what has been done in the past with the Bloomberg and De Blasio administrations. Thank you. Rich? I mean, the Post asked me about this uh, last week uh, when I did a sort of long interview with them, and the, and the answer is I'm not in the position, uh, I don't have information to what security risks are. So it would be inappropriate for me to, to determine, you know, the, the size, the cost, all of that. I just don't have the information on it. I can't, I can't make an informed, I can't give you an informed answer without being someone who's in the room uh, on what the assessments are of his security. And, you know, he's a high-profile person, and <clears throat> I'm not going to second-guess that. Well, maybe how about looking at the campaign offers in the paper rather than the tax I mean, that's a decision he has to make. I'm not going to make that decision for him. I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. Katie?
I mean, Con Ed's uh, recent performance has been absolutely unacceptable, and New York City cannot afford for it to continue like this. New Yorkers spend a lot of money on their electric bills every month. When they open up that Con Ed bill and they see what the cost is, uh, it is pretty expensive for most New Yorkers. And they should not have to deal with subpar service, let alone full blackouts and a record-setting heat wave. So totally unacceptable. There needs to be a top-to-bottom investigation. I don't know how Con Ed, with a straight face, can continue to say they want a rate increase on uh, their customers totally you know unacceptable and there was a report that i saw the other day from uh the nbc affiliate that said that when they got their rate increase in 2004 and 2013 part of the justification for their rate increase was they were going to put between 80 and 100 million dollars into upgrading infrastructure on the relay protection systems and in the most recent psc filings that came out where they had to detail how they use their money how much money did they put in upgrading relay protection systems? Zero. So they used that as justification 10 years ago. They used it as justification six years ago, and we haven't seen the investment. I think the bigger issue in question here that we all have to focus on is number one, infrastructure. Infrastructure is so key and important. So much of what is below our city streets is 40, 50, 80, 100 years old. And we need an infrastructure bill that will actually allow cities and states to go in and do these projects. We've seen the loggerheads on probably the most important infrastructure project in the country, which is the Gateway Tunnel Project uh, below the Hudson River for Amtrak and it's really for the entire eastern seaboard for our economy and we're seeing what's happening uh, inside the MTA uh, with signals malfunctioning and old computer systems not working in the midst of a heat wave so we need to invest in infrastructure and you, with that flooding you saw yesterday it scares me what happens if another Sandy hits how much trouble will New York City be in if that happens again so there's a lot of questions that are raised over the last 10 days and what's happened in New York City and I think we really have to uh, focus on making smart investments in our infrastructure, holding Con Ed to account, and planning for uh, resiliency in case another major storm comes. We have to see exactly what happened. When I spoke, I called the DEP commissioner last night as soon as I saw the reports, and Commissioner Sapienza uh, told me that the reason why you saw the th flooding at Throop and Wallabout, at Fourth Avenue and Carroll, um, uh, and some of these other places, even on the LIE, was because what happens is, uh, in heavy rain, debris covers the catch basins, and until they get manually cleared, then that's what clears the flooding up. So. Um, it could have just been that we didn't do proper removal of debris in advance of uh, a storm coming that would have ensured that they didn't get clogged up. On the question of have we invested enough, I mean, we've invested a lot. We saw a big commitment in this budget we voted on about a month ago in the East Side Resiliency Project, which hopefully would protect uh, the Con Edison plan uh, adjacent to uh, Peter Cooper and Stytown, which was one of the primary sources of the blackout during Sandy when that area got flooded. Uh, but there are still so many parts of this city, from Red Hook to Lower Manhattan to Astoria, that still don't, and Coney Island, that don't have the protection that they need, even though we've done a lot of resiliency measures. But part of the issue here is we can't do all this alone. We need a federal partner to actually work with us on this. And when you have a federal government, when you have an EPA, when you have these different federal agencies that every day are denying the science behind climate change or pulling out of the Paris Accords, are not investing or partnering with states, are rolling back fuel standards for automobiles, I could keep naming things that they do every single day, it becomes hard for a city to do it on its own. With the Obama administration, we had a partner and a leader that wanted to work with us. Under this administration, we have a denier in science and someone uh, who does not help New York City, but tries to hurt us every single day. Yes.
It's unacceptable. It's outrageous. It's uh, this is not how anyone should be conducting themselves in New York City, especially to police officers who are doing their job. Uh, and, and I was uh, appalled by what I saw in that video. Uh, totally unacceptable. Uh, not the way that any New Yorker should be conducting themselves. And, and the NYPD, I think, kept really calm and cool in the midst of having water thrown at them. And not just water. They had a pail thrown at them that struck them in the middle of uh, doing their job. So uh, the video was horrible, uh, and I'm glad that the mayor condemned it. I think that almost every single elected official in New York City, members of this council, you saw the public advocate and the comptroller, everyone has been speaking out against that incident uh, and what happened. You know, I, I all I saw was the video, and I, I know that the officers were in the middle of making an arrest, and so I don't know if there was enough personnel there to, for them to be able to do both, but um, I'm sure the NYPD got more information by interviewing those officers and by looking at the video footage, so um, I, I don't have enough information to be able to, to comment on if that's what the NYPD is saying. Yes? Well, we had a we had a hearing, and the council has advising and consent. And the hearing we had last Thursday, um, council members, not just myself, but council members had questions. We wanted to hear a vision for the Taxi and Limousine Commission. I think this is probably one of the most important uh, juncture points for the TLC, maybe in its entire existence because of the upheaval we've seen in the industry because of the rash of suicides by drivers uh, and because of these predatory lending practices and the lack of regulatory oversight by outside agencies in ensuring that this didn't happen to drivers who actually couldn't afford the loans for these medallions. So we asked questions, and I was not satisfied with those answers. I think there were a lot of members who were not satisfied with those answers. We expected a vision. We expected specificity. We expected uh, comments and feedback on the proposed bills that the council has put forward in the wake of the New York Times investigation, uh, looking at the predatory lending practices of the industry, and we didn't hear that. So we are internally figuring out how to proceed. Ivan? Uh, yesterday, the, uh, well, first, uh, one issue is asking the bill to ban cannabis or the restaurants. Is supposed to be updated or postponed? I mean, do you have any concerns with that bill? No, which is just there were further, at the end of the, this happens all the time with bills, it's just usually those, they're not ones that are as high profile as this. At the end, when we are uh, laying bills, when we are aging bills, when we are um, looking at them in the final hours and looking at the language around them, sometimes things get kicked a little bit. Uh, and I expect this will be voted on at the next uh, stated meeting. There's nothing more than that. It's just the staff here continuing to do their job in a thorough manner, and that's what happened in this instance. Yes, I do. Any other questions? Well, you know, uh, hopefully by this weekend. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.